think about Mike? Do you think you think Mike's more of a preacher than a teacher? <laughs> what do you think? Come on, tell me. What, yeah. Hands up for preacher. Anybody? Preacher. 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 Yeah. And teacher. Yeah. And teacher. A preacher who can teach. Yes. Yeah. 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 But uh, I call it a little more preacher boy. He, he, he digs deep into that passion. Yeah. He, he's he, he, he nice boys. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I can do a little both, but uh, just depends on on what the need is. But Mike, he's always got the got the big voice and the good preach. <laughs> so where are we, Mark? Chapter. Yeah, we're gonna go to the next chapter in eight. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna kind of pick it up there. Hey, Mark. Okay. You can come on. Come on. All right. Um, now, this is an interesting chapter to me because it's kind of like a repeat of, of, of earlier chapters when Jesus feeds people and he goes through the same process of feeding people. I think it's pretty interesting because <laughs> you would think after a while you kind of get it, you know, that if you've done something with Jesus, and how many ever said to me yourself, you know, I would have liked to have been in there, you know, in Jesus' day. I would have, I would have liked to be in a ministry with Jesus. I would have liked to be there, you know. And I still think it's so funny that these guys here, they've been there, they've actually been through this at least two other times. And yet the same question is posed to them. Jesus kind of comes to the to the table there saying, hey, these guys are hungry. What, you know, what we got to feed them, you know. And just think, this has already happened twice. So it's kind of like three strikes you're out because they, it was amazing that the third time they're still like, well, what are we going to do? Which is pretty amazing to me because it's like, well, I don't know. If it was me, I'd say, who's got the fish? Who's got the loaves? Bring what you got and Jesus is going to make some more of it. Amen? And we're, we're going to have leftovers. This is, this is, the, this is the, uh, the, the MO, you know, of Jesus. You know, you give me what you got. We'll make more of it. You guys will be a part of it. You'll be the hands. I'll be the source, you know, and we do this. And then we're going to have leftovers for everyone and send them home, not only filled, but with extra. Amen. I mean, does anybody remember this? Amen. So here we come, we, we come into it on the eighth chapter again. He says, in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because I have, they have... Now come, continued with me three days, and they have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far. And his disciples answered him, How can one satisfy this people with bread in the wilderness? All right? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took seven loaves and gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave them to his disciples, and he set them before them, and they before the multitude. So we see that pattern, don't we? We see, remember, we, we talked about that, what that pattern is. We talked about it was blessed, broken, and multiplied. Remember, your life goes through those cycles of blessed, broken, and multiplied. Maybe you weren't here for that week, so this might be new to you. But the idea here is that you'll see this inevitably in life. You see, when you first get born again, you're blessed. And then there's a time of brokenness where you find out, oh yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to reintegrate back into the world. You know, I'm supposed to take this Jesus that I just that just overwhelms my life and that has just taken over my life, but I'm supposed to do something with that. I'm supposed to reintegrate into the lives of the people that I'm in and into my life as it goes forward. So there's a brokenness when we decide when we find, oh yes, it's not just Jesus and me. You know, how many of you were great saints when it was just you? And you got in a relationship with somebody, and you're like, oh, gee, I didn't have it all together as much as I thought I did, you know? And then you had children, and you were like, oh, gee, I didn't have it as much together as I thought I did. Then they grew up and became teenagers, and you're like, oh, gee, I didn't have it all together like I thought I did, you know? And so you go through these cycles of, of being blessed, you know? We're on top of this. We're going to write a book about how wonderful marriage is, you know? And then, you know, then it comes into this kind of screeching halt when you guys have disagreement about something serious in life, you know. And then you're like, oh, I'm glad I didn't read, write that book. Maybe I should be reading somebody else's book about it, you know. 
And then you go, you, you know, you make it through that and you get victory, so you're multiplied now, and then you go back to that place where we're good, let's write a book now, you know, and then make a movie, I don't know, do something exciting that we've done in our lives, you know, and then you go back to that place where there's something, some new challenge that you didn't think was going to rock your world, and lo and behold, it does. Amen? Amen? But that's the cycle of being blessed, broken, and multiplied. And multiplied is where we want to be, but it doesn't come without the blessed and the brokenness at times. Amen? Amen? And again, Jesus doesn't break us so that he can teach us a lesson of just how vulnerable and everything is always the purpose of being multiplied in the end. That's, that's any, anything that Jesus touches, it multiplies. You, me, anyone, right? And that's why, that's why we so desperately want for Jesus and people to connect. Because we know what's best for them is the same thing that was best for us. We walked through a lot of life, didn't know Jesus was really much good for us, called him a crutch, and thought he was just another religious figure in life. But realized, no, he's real, he's alive, he's a, he, we can have a relationship with him, and that relationship can, can, can bring vibrance to your life, and bring meaning to it, and purpose to it, and then you want to share that. Amen? Amen. So that's why we share. I mean, it's not like we're out there just trying to propagate a, a religion. We, we're doing what it is good for me, it's good for you. That's, our, that's, my, that's the simple life perspective, you know. I was lost and now I'm found. It ain't hard, you know. So, all right, so they're in the same place, third time around, just don't get it. You know, got to give them some leeway because of the fact they weren't born again. But, you know, jeepers, creepers, guys, put a little effort into it, you know. All right, so... Um, then, let's see, so they go through the same cycle, we are aware, in verse, say, seven. seven. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said to them, and he set them before them, so they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away, he immediately got into a boat with his disciples, and came to the region of, somebody help me out there. What is that? Like, All right, that sounds great. I looked up, actually looked it up, and it, it, it's like questionable that it where it was. So I figured that means about nothing to us. But I like I like it sounds like Dalmatian, so that made, <laughs> kind of tickled me. All right. So then the Pharisees came and uh, began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit, and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say that no sign shall be given to this generation. Mm -hmm. All right, now, I, I just happened to have noticed this. There was a lot of deep sighing in Jesus' spirit. I, mm -hmm. I've not actually seen this in any other book of the Bible as many times as I saw this here. And I don't know what exactly that really is. You know, I, 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 I will kind of give some conjecture along the way, but, you know, I get frustrated. Anybody else get frustrated? Yes. Any parents get frustrated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, you know, it, it, it's this cycle of, I thought we covered this. <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought we had this down. You know, I, I thought we connected, but we obviously did because we're back here again. Amen. 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 And that, that's you know, and you can you wives. Oh my. You know, I just listen from afar ah. to my own wife. You know, I'm listening to her right in there. But, I mean, I'm hearing what she's saying for the entire female human race whenever she talks to me. You know, because it's like men are men for the most part, you know, and women are for the most part like other women. And so, you know, I, I listen from afar to hear what she's really saying about all men, you know, not just me. So it's kind of a little comforting in all fairness, you know. But... Uh, you know, how many times there's, how many times do I have to tell you? You know, and it, it's usually communication. It's that thing in my life that, I don't know, I just never was taught that, you know. And I don't want to get into the dirty <laughs> stuff about that. But, you know, when you have a dysfunctional family, part of that dysfunction carries over into communication. Mm -hmm. There just isn't any. <laughs> you know? And when there's no communication, you, you grow up just kind of in that mode, you know? And it takes God and a woman to bring men into, a, into an arena where they communicate successfully. 
So I listen from afar because I realize it's not just me. You know, this, is, this is a male issue. And I think most women would probably say, yeah, you're right, you know. But then again, there are exceptions. There are some guys that are just, you know, they just talk and everything. And they're mostly in the beauty parlors or in the theater. But nonetheless, the idea oh, is, you know, they talk, 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 and you're like, that is so weird, you know? That is not what most guys are doing. They're out there just zipping it lip. They're more like the guy from Tim the Tool Man. You know? Yeah, yeah. Just like, <laughs> you know, just whatever, just whatever's on the top of your head comes right out, and it's just blunt, and it's short, and it's not meant to be a very sensitive thing. It's just what it is. <laughs> so we need women to teach us how to communicate. Amen. Now you can get it by the Holy Spirit, but sometimes we're not listening as well to Him. But our wives do speak to us about that. So guys, when Jesus sighed heavily, I don't know exactly which one and why He was sighing so heavily, but I do know I have heard that before, and it's usually from my wife. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, let's see, we are in verse... Uh, all right, well, I didn't really cover those rests. I, I just kind of went off on something there. So Jesus says uh, that there's not going to be a sign to this generation. Now, I would be unfair to you just to take this one verse in context and not allow the full gospel to be shared with you. I did find at least, I believe it was three other times that Jesus used this saying. But most of those other times, there was, uh, let's see, three times in Matthew that he used this statement. A sign will not be given to this generation. But it was also accompanied with an exception. He would say, no sign is going to be given to this generation except mm -hmm. the sign of Jonah. Amen. Okay? So that was the, uh, maybe Mark didn't put that extra piece in there. You know, I'm not real sure, but I know that three other times when it was used, it was accompanied by the sign of Jonah. Now, the sign of Jonah is very important because um, it, it it reminded me of what happened in Luke, and uh, this is just, I'm just going to ask you to think back there with me, but I'll give you the verse. Uh, Luke 16, 30 through 31. Here, Abraham is, is in paradise, and, uh, and, and Lazarus, the, the poor man, is there with him. And then on the other side of a great chasm is uh, uh, the rich man that in life was, uh, was alive in the doorkeeper or the, the house where Lazarus begged. So Lazarus was always baking at his door. And in, uh, as they passed, the rich man, not because he was rich, but because he did not follow the law of Moses or the prophets. That was the only way that you could get as close to God as was possible, was following the law and the prophets. Now we know that closeness and that that. That gap has been closed by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. But most of us would say that all that was in the law and the prophets would have been surmised in what Jesus said. To love your neighbor, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. All ten commandments would have been comprised in those things, as well as the prophets. So we didn't get off any easier. I think most of us would say... You know, maybe even we, you know, we have it a little harder in the respect that the standards aren't just written in black and white. They're an always-on experience that I'm called to live within, the boundaries of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So I don't get off any easier than just having Ten Commandments and a few prophetic utterances. I've got, I've got the Holy Spirit who's always in me, kind of leading, guiding, and directing. But... If they were to live by everything, every light that they have, we all walk in the light that we have. We have greater light because of the Holy Spirit within us, but we all are expected to walk in the light that we have. He wasn't walking in the light that he had. And in this, in this, uh, this, this story that Jesus tells, the rich man is there, and uh, the rich man says, "Hey, you know, this is a place of torment. Please, Abraham." He looks so far off. It actually says he. He looks up, so we're kind of getting a little bit of a geographic lesson, but we're not there for that today. He looks up and, and he says, uh, Abraham, would you please just send Lazarus to go back and tell my brothers of this place. I've got five brothers and I want them to know of this place. And Abraham says something interesting in return. Abraham says to him, uh, basically, it's a no-go. <laughs> he says, um, 
they're not going to believe. They have Moses and the prophets. He said, uh, they're not going to believe even if one raises from the dead. Mm. Now that statement is power packed, obviously, because it's not just referring, it, 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 it's broad. It refers to the fact that even if Jesus raised from the dead, that there's still not going to be enough evidence for people who don't want to believe. Amen. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. Because believing is a choice. No matter how much the evidence is, is, is presented to you, if you don't want to believe, you'll find a way not to. So really, even though somebody rose from the dead, which he did, and it was not only him, but saints who had gone before him were raised and were seen of people in Jerusalem, just to give you the full picture of what happened. And it's not like the world turned over and said, we all believe now. Okay? So Jesus isn't doing anything wrong to say, well, we're not going to be giving any more signs and wonders to this generation so that you'll believe you've got the law, you've got the prophets. Because God knows the heart of man, doesn't he? And he knows that it's a choice and that you're going to have to make that choice for yourself. Amen? Amen. Amen. And God's not in the business of trying to play a circus act where he jumps through enough hoops to finally uh, earn your faith. Amen? Amen. So here's what inter what's, uh, uh, what's interesting. Is that uh, if we go on to the verse next, let's see. Alright, verse 12. So we looked at what, what uh, other authors, including especially Matthew, had said about the fact that Jesus probably stated, except the sign of Jonah, who had gone through the fact that that meant, of course, somebody being raised from the dead and still not believing, that people still chose not to believe. But here's an interesting thing. If we look um, a little further, say, verse, we'll read for, uh, 13, 14. Probably 15, okay? He, and then he left the conversation. Now, again, uh, Sam had told me last last week, I think it was, he said, no, I like going through the book, you know, because it's, it's more contextual. And it really is. It's because we can take a couple of verses here and there, and, 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 and it, it's still good. But when we keep it in the context, and we really try to follow the flow of what's going on, it really does help us to see a bigger picture. And in this case, uh, Remember, they just got finished with the feeding of the 4,000. I believe it was 4, I could be wrong, but I believe it was 4,000. And, um, and then they go from this to a confrontation with the, uh, the Pharisees. And Jesus uh, whips out a quick comment, and then it looks like he just gets in the boat and heads out. But here's what's interesting is that he gets in the boat and he heads out, and then he says this, which, again, if you're not in the flow of what's going on here, you're like, where is this coming from? And he charged them, saying, take heed, beware. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to start in verse 14. And they got in the boat again, and it says, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, uh, and they did not uh, have but one loaf, basically. Now again, so what? So what? They just came out of feeding 4,000 with a few <laughs> loaves and a few fish. I mean, it's... It, it, it boggles the mind. Don't you think? Yes. This would have been the fourth encounter with bread, and we got Jesus with us, and we just don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, does it, does it not tickle you in the least to see this kind of thing? So here he says, and again, he, the context is, they're thinking, shoot, we forgot lunch. We only got a darn loaf of bread. So Jesus then, he says, he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. <laughs> You're going to laugh. Because there he is, kind of, in tune with their thoughts about bread, and he starts talking about the leaven of the 
the uh, Pharisees and Herod. And so they just haven't got it because you'll see in the, the conversation that ensues, uh, which I, I, I guess it's probably good that we read the, the conversation first. So uh, then in verse 16, he reason, they reasoned among themselves saying, is it because we have no bread? Now again, this is, this is, this is after feeding 4,000 people. I, I guess they sent everybody home with the leftovers because the, the disciples did not have them. <laughs> and so they, uh, they're like, what? is this because we don't have any bread? <laughs> <laughs> So Jesus is aware of it, and he says to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? In other words, mm-hmm, we just fed up with all that. We, all you need is a crumb. We're good. If, it's all good. Don't worry about this. Why, do we, why are we reasoning that it's bread? He says, Don't you have eyes, and, and do you not see? And Don't you have ears, but you're not hearing? And don't you remember that we broke the five loaves and fed 5,000? How many baskets and fragments did you have to take up? And they said 12. He said also when we had uh, seven for the 4,000, how many large basketfuls of fragments did you take up? And they said seven. And he said, how is it that you don't understand? <laughs> All right, so here is an interesting thing that, that they are completely into the bread mode while Jesus is trying to get them into a think about something that is and think about how I'm trying to teach you something else. Mm. Right? right? I'm trying to teach you something else about what affects you like leaven would affect a loaf. And so he... He talks about these two leavens. I call it two leavens to avoid. <laughs> two leavens to avoid. Now, he doesn't really say what they are. Now, of course, in Mark, uh, I'm sorry, in Matthew, as we look back, he saw, we saw where a part of what Jesus said could have been more fully understood by what was one of the authors of the other gospel had shared with us about no sign except the sign of Jonah. That helps out a little bit, right? Now, likewise, um, when we say this leaven, uh, the two leavens to avoid the leaven of the Pharisees, you're thinking, what is that? And what is the what is the leaven of Herod? You know, and I can't like exactly, precisely say. I I do see that Jesus said. Again, that same statement about beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He did say that over in Luke, and uh, that's in 12.1. And in that case, he said that it's hypocrisy. That's what he said about that. But then you have to ask yourself, well, what exactly is hypocrisy? You know? Because if you've ever been angry, you ever been angry? Anyone? Yes. I see no hands. There's some with no hands raised. All right. So if you've ever been angry, and, 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 and then that person that you might have been angry with, they were like, well, you're not much of a Christian. <laughs> right? Never hear that one? Mm -hmm. If you were a Christian, you wouldn't be angry. No. I'm very angry. Yeah. And because I'm a Christian, I'm not going to act in my anger. But I'm still very angry. <laughs> I don't know, that might be a revelation for somebody. <laughs> but the idea here is that if you've ever been angry and somebody just came back at you with the old, you're a hypocrite kind of thing, mm. you know, then you understand a little bit about what people might call a hypocrite. But their assessment of a hypocrite probably is not the same as what Jesus is talking about here when he's talking about a hypocrite, right? So he's, he actually used the Pharisees and the Sadducees in other places to say, hey, watch out for this kind of leaven. Okay? Now, granted, in one other place when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, I believe it is, he uses leaven. It's not always the same, but it, for the majority of the time, it's not a good thing. The majority of the time that Jesus uses it. And you can understand the context in which it's really meant. If it's in the context of, hey, don't be like them, well, that's, that's a bad thing. Or, hey, be like this, then it would be a good thing. Okay, so it's, it's, 
don't get all hung up on just the idea of leaven. The idea is something small that can infiltrate the whole and cause it to be something pretty different. How many of you like crackers? Like crackers? I like crackers. Do you know the little crackers we have when we have communion? It's matzah or something, you know? That's, that's unleavened bread. How many of you like to go to Panera? Anybody? I went to Panera yesterday. Anybody like Panera? Okay. When you like Panera, what's, I mean, pretty much everything is served on bread or with bread, right? That's kind of their thing. They made something mundane and normal that everybody has every day, but they made it something you look forward to and special. Artisan, right? Or the newest word that is so catchy among everybody that serves any kind of food is handcrafted. Yes. I'm like, honestly, did you really think a robot was back there making my sandwich? I knew that the whole time. I mean, it's not, it's no news to me, you know. Handcrafted doesn't suddenly make it click where I, now I really want your coffee because it's handcrafted. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. The idea here is that it, it, it's something that, that infiltrates and changes that whole. When you go to Panera, you get a big fluffy piece of bread. You don't want a cracker. Right? That's what it, it would be a cracker if it didn't have some leaven in it. Make it fluffy and nice. I'm sure you throw a few other things. But the idea is it changes. And Jesus is saying, don't let yourself be changed. And in this particular thing, the influence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, in the, and he also talks about Herod. So what you have to do is you kind of have to look at who they are, their interactions with him, and say, what is it that they did that caused Jesus to consider them hypocr uh, hypocrites? They weren't people that just were like, wake up one day and say, oh man, I really want to serve God today. And then they start out serving God today, and then somebody just really does something that makes them terribly disappointed, and they do or say the wrong thing. That is not their intention. Most of the time, just like it says here, they are intentionally testing. They are, their, their goal is to discredit for the purpose of making themselves look better. Now, in this context, that is the accurate and concise definition of a hypocrite. And more so, in this case, spiritual leaders who are only leading to be seen without any interest for the others. If they were interested in those they were leading, they would do things differently. But because their only interest is to lead to be seen as a leader, they will try to subvert anyone who is a threat to them and their leadership to retain the power of simply being looked at as a leader. So he says, watch out for that. You don't want to be a leader who only leads to be seen as a leader. Now, many of you are thinking here, don't worry, I'm no leader. Here's the interesting thing. I want to ask you today, I know that you are trying to serve God. I know that you are trying to love God. I know many of you do personal things. I hear and I say, wow, you're better than I because I wouldn't be doing that. You know, and it's just amazing to me sometimes the grace that God's given each one of you to do what you do. And you're, you know, you may look at me and say, I don't want to be up there doing and doing what you do. So hats off to both your graces. You know, but the idea here is that uh, my question would be, if you were to just throw in the hat, if you were to just say, the heck with it all, I'm doing what I want, when I want, how I want to do it, do you think that that would affect anyone else in your life? Yes. yes. I think it would. I don't know who it would be because each of you have different people in your life. But to say you're not a leader, you must then look at your own life and say, if I went AWOL, if I went off the rails, would it affect anyone else's life? 
And if you can honestly say that it would affect nobody else's life, then you're the only person I know in this room that is not a leader. But everyone else is a leader. And you can answer that question by simply saying, if I went off the rails, would it affect anyone else? And I think you can all point to someone that it would affect. Because you are a leader. Maybe not in the way that, you know, grandiose church leader. Or maybe you are. But the idea here is that it doesn't matter. The simple question is, how will that affect other people by what I do? And if you affect just one person, you are a leader. So, you need to be on guard for being seen as a leader and not letting the vulnerabilities of your life be realized by those around you. Not letting yourself be seen for the person you are in spite of your flaws. You know? And, and I, you know, I think it's cliche because we all say nobody's perfect. <laughs> but if somebody points out our imperfections, we're like, what are you doing? You know? We're all defensive. <laughs> well, well, wait a minute. We all just said nobody's perfect. And then we, we kind of raise our hand and say, I'm not perfect. But how many get defensive when somebody points out those imperfections in our life? See, that's where the hypocrite in us, you know, if we persist in trying to then undermine those who are genuinely just trying to show us how to be better, we're hypocrites. Okay? I don't know any of those people in here because those people have always been open to honest reflection through the mirror of other people. You know, because that's the best reflection you can look at. Yes, you can look at the Word of God. Yes, it is. But you know what? When we're not looking at the Word, the second best reflection to ourselves is the people that we Amen? Amen. All right. So let me get... We talked about kind of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Again, they un always undermine Jesus. And Jesus is what? Trying to help. Right? Always... Always trying to down Jesus, catch him in one of those little things where Jesus doesn't know what to say. Except he always knew what to say, but they're always trying to catch him. And, you know, well, Moses said this, you know. But what do you say? They're always just trying to undermine his authority so that theirs would look legit. Unfortunately, they were up against someone that they did not know they were messing with. Amen. Amen. But here's then that second question. Who's the other? Who's the other leaven? He says, the leaven of Herod. You're like, well, I don't know Herod very much. Some people do say, and I, you know, I read a bunch of stuff and then I try to boil it down. Sometimes it doesn't, doesn't boil down to what what looks like everybody agrees on. So in this case they'll say, well, some that's that Herod was a political pawn or puppet per se, placed there by the Romans to to allow them to think they're, they're self-governing when genuinely it was just simply the Romans placing a, a puppet leader, if you will, over them. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't see the connection too much. So let me just reach a little and give you some perspective. Here's the thing, is that the only way I know here, personally, uh, you know, I could do a little study, and I did a little study on him through Wikipedia, but you know, that's about as reliable, who knows what. But you can rely on the scriptures. So in the scriptures, let's go back and check out Herod for a minute. All right? My best recollection of Herod was uh, his interaction with John the Baptist. Now, we read this earlier, so there's some context in which we can look at it. Now, you remember that, that uh, he took his brother's wife, you know, and, and that wasn't cool, was it? You know? And then John stepped in there and said, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Okay? So now, here's another leader, isn't it? Herod is a leader. Mm -hmm. But that leader now has that leadership uh, challenged by someone godly in John's case. Now, in Herod's case, when he was challenged with, with his, when his leadership was challenged by John, he chose to stick that leadership in jail. Now, we do this a little bit, you know. We have something that we 
no, we're not doing the way we should or that we're not doing what we should. And instead of just bringing it out in the light, taking the beating and saying, you're right, I'm wrong, let's do it your way. We put it down. We shove it down in there and we put it in some little corner and we kind of lock the door. And every once in a while we look through the people at it and say, I just want to be sure I have a conscience, so I'm going to look at that thing again, you know, make sure it's still down there bugging me. But I don't want to act on it, you know, I don't want to let it loose, you know. I don't, I don't want to let it challenge the leadership in my life. So eventually uh, you see that Herod uh, is, is played by uh, his wife and daughter-in-law, and that he eventually places John the Baptist to death. Which is not unusual again, that that whole idea that when we don't like the challenge to our leadership, to the, the thing that we see that other people think about us, the way they look at us, the, the thing they think we are, that we know we're not, We either respond positively to that and let the light shine and we come out with it and we say, you know what, I want to grow in this area. How, how can I grow in this? Or we stick it in a dungeon or eventually we put it to death. And we do that by trying to, dis, to, to discredit the words of others or the actions of others or their very person. In this case, the only way that he could eventually get rid of John the Baptist's challenge to what was going on in him as a leader was not only to lock him up, but eventually to put him to death. If you look throughout the scriptures, look at Cain and Abel, it's the same kind of a story. Instead of Cain saying, you know what, Abel had it right. I had it wrong. Yes, I'm the firstborn of the family. Yes, I should have done the right thing. But I didn't. So how can I be a better man? Well, instead of saying, how can I be a better man? Abel, can you, can you help me out here? He said, Abel, let's go for a walk. And then he killed him. It's a habit. We either walk in the light that's given to us, or we try our best to dim the source. Amen? So I think this is what... Jesus is talking about, watch out for. Even when you're a good, godly Christian leader, there's going to be things in your life that you know you could be better. And eventually, if you don't respond, God will send somebody who will put their finger on that area of your life. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't freak out. Just realize, God loves you enough not to leave you the way you are. Amen. 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 And so he'll send somebody, and you have a choice. You can either succumb to the leaven of the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and Herod. You can silence the voice of that one voice that is actually there to make you better. You can discredit their life. You can discredit them. You can tell everybody how imperfect they are, what they don't do. Or you can say, you know what? You're right. This is my chance to man up. This is my chance to be a better man. Amen. Beware of the leaven of Pharisees, Sadducees, and of Herod. All of which, instead of letting their challenge of leadership make them better leaders. They chose to discredit and eventually kill the source of light that was shining in their lives. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to leave you with that thought and some other thing that I just happen to be thinking about today because uh, actually I was thinking about it the other day. And we talked about it a little earlier today. And that is, um, Jesus talked about the wind, didn't he? Talked about the wind in John 3. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just going to refer to that to help us out in the coming week. And uh, one of those things is that when he talked about the wind, I, I don't know about you, but uh, especially on, a, on a, a pleasant day, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to go outside and to, to see the, the, the surroundings and to see the sky and to see the, 
But you know what? Most of us get in our car and we notice, oh, it's not raining. Awesome. The sun is shining. Awesome. But we get in our car, we come back at the end of the day, we're tired, we go, we eat, we sleep, we do it again. Now, all around us, the wind is blowing, isn't it? And it takes a stop and, and take a moment to actually feel that, doesn't it? And if we were to stop and feel, if you close your eyes, you can actually then feel the wind blow. And then you can feel it shift and blow in the other direction. But only if you stop for a moment and commit yourself to being sensitive to which way the wind is blowing. They have a, a kind of a, uh, I guess, an exercise in understanding how to slow your life down a little bit. They tell you, just close your eyes, stop for a minute, and tell me what you hear. Good. And a lot of times you'll hear all these things that you thought, oh, I normally would never hear them. They've always been there. But you don't notice them because you don't take the time to slow yourself down and notice what goes on. Can I tell you that's pretty much what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the wind. He says, look, you realize that if you were to just stop for a minute, you could enjoy a spirit-led life. But it doesn't come, it doesn't invade your busy life. You have to stop for a moment and say, I'm going to recognize which way the wind blows now. And I know that seems silly, but the reality is, is that all around you, life will just keep you going at such a pace where you will miss so much. Amen. Or you can take a minute and say, I'm going to stop. See, the world won't stop, but you can stop. Mm. You say, I'm going to stop for a minute. I'm going to see which way the wind's blowing. You're just going to stand there for a minute. Because if you want to be the kind of leader, small, large, or whatever God gives or causes you to be, it's going to take that ability to not just go cranial, but to sit back and say, okay, the world can be in chaos, but I don't have to try. Hmm. Just let, let the Holy Spirit blow on that sensitive part of you that can, do, that can discern what direction the wind is blowing. I say that because Here's an opportunity to avoid the leaven of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and I'm calling it a spirit-led life. Recognize when someone or something, whether it's a radio broadcast or a DVD you're watching or a real book you're reading, and become better. God brings people into our lives and they are imperfect. And they do wrong. And they don't always have the right intent. That doesn't mean they're not brought by God into our lives. Amen. <laughs> so don't be looking for the perfect person before you consider they might have something of value in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen because you'll miss all that God has for you in between. Let's pray. Jesus had talked about uh, having ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand in these verses. And that's when a person stops, stops not only just stops what they're doing, but stops attacking other people or looking for deficits in them so they can throw off the yoke of their authority in their lives. And, you know, husbands and wives, oh, you're supposed to be, you know, submissive to me. Well, 
you know, that doesn't mean they don't have anything valid at that moment, even while you're feeling that pushback and that tension. I need you to just close your eyes for a minute and hear what the Spirit might be saying before you go off on trying to undermine the authority so that you don't have to listen. So, Father God, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we all have got so much to learn. We've got so much further to go. We've got so many places that we can be taken to by you. And it really just means that the most important thing that I can give to you, I can give you love, but it's always on my terms. I can give you praise, but it's always on my terms. I can give you worship, but it's always on my terms. I can give you all these things, money, time, but it's always on my terms. So what I'm choosing to give you is my will. Because when I do that, I've given up my terms. Amen. So I've chosen to give you the best thing that I believe I can give to God. Like Jesus said in the garden, in the moment of his deepest passion, nevertheless, not my will but yours, I believe that was the utmost expression. Because I've tried to love God I've tried to give him my love. But much to my chagrin, when I'm tired, when I'm spent, I still hold back. But when it comes to my will, if I say, God, not my will, but yours, I really think that's the best thing I can offer him today. So what I'd like to do is just challenge you. This morning, would you like to make that proclamation. Would you like to give God what I think He most deserves from us? Is our willingness. I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing to say I'm sorry or I'm willing to admit that I'm wrong or I'm, I'm willing to go where I didn't want to go or I'm willing to talk to who I didn't want to talk to or I'm willing, I'm willing to do whatever. And, and my willingness, I believe, is the best I can give to God. So, and I, I do that because I love it. But my will, it actually supersedes what I, what I would call any other gift I can give to you. My willingness. So I'm giving him that. And I'm asking you if you're, uh, if you're willing to give him your willingness this morning. You know what's in your heart. You know what you mean. I'm, I'm going to lead in a prayer. You can put it in your words. You can follow right along. But right now, let's pray together. God, I give to you my will. My willingness to go where I otherwise wouldn't. To be what I otherwise can't. God, I give you my willingness. Jesus name. In Jesus name. Now before you open your eyes and look up, I'd like to ask this simple question. Is there anyone here real quick? That you're, you're here and you're saying, you know what, I, I, uh, I need to get right with God. I need to be in that place. And I don't know how and I don't know the steps to take, but I know I need to. If that's you, you just look up at me and just quickly and say, that's me. Is there anyone real quick? I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to believe God to do, uh, to do what you want, what you just asked, to be right with Him. So I'm going to pray for you now. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you saw every heart that was lifted. You saw every eyes that were raised. And I ask right now, Father God, that you enable, because I know your word says it is you that work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. I wouldn't even have a desire to do it if it wasn't for you. But God, you've given me that desire. I know that because I, I feel the pull. I feel the tug. I, I, I feel that you're moving. So I give you my will. I give you my willingness. I will do what you wish. I will be where you want me to be. I will say and act and do as best I can what I discern to be your will. In Jesus' name.
Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us through the book of Mark here. Uh, I think we got two-thirds way through that, so that's good. Uh, but let's go ahead and receive this morning's tithes and offerings. And uh, we have some awesome times of fellowship ahead of us with each other. And uh, if you're able to join us, we certainly hope you will. We have some fruit back there for you people watching out for your health. Thank God for that. And we probably got some stuff that's probably equally as unhealthy for you. So just Thank you, God for that too. You, be achieved, you be the choice of what's best for you. But uh, let's go ahead and receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Before I ask Catherine, who is always uh, willing, um, is there anyone you feel especially that you just pray because you, you're in a place where you're believing God for financial